So grab your East Bay Weekly, and on the back you'll see we're in James in chapter 2 is where we start today, James chapter 2. And so also grab your copy of the scriptures or your electronic device and uh, find James chapter 2. It's almost to the very end of your Bible. So go to the very right, and if you find like uh, the book of Revelation or something like that, then take a left and scooch back. And maybe if you find the book of Hebrews, you just need to go to the right just a little bit, and right there's the book of James in chapter 2. Now, you know, we're going to talk about favoritism, and I think in today's world, people are always looking maybe for one way or another to kind of be maybe one up on others, you know, maybe a way to be noticed a little bit more than other people. They want to have maybe a position a little bit over, and so maybe they want to be known for having more money or for looking better than others or um, maybe some kind of a social status or maybe better clothing or maybe it's a famous bloodline, you know, my heritage. It's kind of um, like this story I read um, about a Chicago bank that one once asked for a letter of recommendation on this young man from Boston being considered for employment. And the Chicago bank put out this note and said, um, you know, please give us an understanding, a recommendation on his credentials. And the Boston Investment House could not say enough about the young man. His father, they wrote, was a Cabot. His mother was a Lowell. Further back was a happy blend of salt and stalls and Peabody's and others of Boston's first families. And and his recommendation was given without hesitation. Several days later, the Chicago bank sent back a note saying the information supplied for the reference was completely inadequate. It read, Please forward a recommendation on the quality of the applicant's abilities. We are contemplating using the young man for work, not for breeding purposes. <laughs> so the Bible, just like our society, has examples of favoritism. And on both sides of it, on one side it talks about people who give partiality. And look down on other people. And so whenever I think of that, I think of the Pharisees. And the Pharisees were a group of religious individuals that looked down on so many other groups of people who didn't do things their way. And they looked down on other religious groups. They looked down on the poor. They looked down on the sinners. On people who just didn't quite measure up in society and in religion, and and they really felt that they were esteemed in one way. And so they gave favoritism and preference to all the people that did it their way, and to the others they gave nothing. And then Scripture's full of examples of people who maybe sought favoritism. They wanted preferential treatment, And and I end up thinking about a few different individuals. One of Um, which was a situation in the Gospels where uh, it was James and John and, and their mother, and they wanted them to have preference with Jesus for being top dogs in the kingdom of God when it comes. And in fact, not only was it them, but all of the disciples were arguing Hey, I want to have the top spot. No, I want to have the top spot. And they kept going back and forth. Who would be the favorite in the kingdom of heaven? Then there was another example I remember in the early church of these two individuals, a husband and wife team, Ananias and Sapphira. Almost sounds like a title to a country song, doesn't it? Don't even try to sing it right now. I know it's going through your head. And they wanted people to look better on them. And so you know what they did? They lied about how much money they gave. Hey, we're giving it all. Look at us. You know, and and they wanted people to look upon them with favoritism. 
based upon their financial status and what they were giving, and the whole thing was a sham. And they ended up leaving church that day in a very peculiar way, never to return again. So here's favoritism. It's not new to our society. It actually found itself all the way back in biblical times. And it's even in the passage that we are talking about today in James chapter 2, starting in verse 1. So let's just jump right into this thing. We're going to discuss what favoritism is all about and how Scripture sees it. And then we're even going to talk about some ways that beyond this example, maybe how favoritism evidences itself in today's church context. So here we go. Starting in verse 1. I'm just going to read verses 1 through 13. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. So suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. And if you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, Here's a good seat for you, which obviously in our church would be farther to the back. That's not funny, people. It's the truth. So anyways, where were we? The back seat, somewhere. Um, about, yeah, but say to the poor man, you sit up front. No, it, um, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you've dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they, are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. And if you do not commit adultery but do commit murder, you become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. And mercy triumphs over judgment. So here we go. James 2, get your East Bay Weekly. Let's work through this thing together. I want to talk about the problem with these Christians starting right in verse 1, and James just jumps right into it. You know, faith, it does work. It does work, but it works when we are impartial. It works when we're impartial. <clears throat> and so here the problem with these Christians, James says it, bam, verse 1, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Now, I want you to see this is a really neat word for favoritism. The word favoritism or partiality means this, receiving the face receiving the face that's what the word means in the original language that it was written receiving the face and so we're looking at the face we're looking at the part that basically we see first it's the most visible thing and people look at that external <clears throat> their physical appearance their social status their money their intellect their position their race, whatever it may be, they're looking at the outside and instantly, just by first glance, they make an assessment of just what type of person they think they are. 
before they know anything else about the quality of character or anything about the individual. They're receiving the face. Now we're told, finish the phrase, do not judge a book by its cover. But it happens all the time with people, doesn't it? I'm going to tell you another example when it happened. It was back in the Old Testament. When God had told Samuel, the prophet, we need to find a new king. Saul was finishing out his time. We need to find a new king. And he sent Samuel to this household. There were eight sons. Samuel walks in, and which one will it be? And all of the older sons step into the room. Whom would God choose to replace Saul? Would he somehow be bigger, more attractive, stronger, a better warrior? Someone more trained in military activity? Maybe someone with this deep, strong Jewish loyalty? And here, it was none of the above. It was the youngest of eight boys doing menial tasks from a tiny, obscure town with a family that didn't have the best past. And whatever things that David had going for him, he didn't have it over his other brothers. They were bigger, they were bolder, they were more handsome. And at first look, Samuel steps in the room and he looks around and he sees Eliab, which was the oldest brother, and, he, and he's thinking, that's got to be the one right there. He's the man. That's the next king of Israel. And in that one moment, young David stepped into the room and God said, that's the one. And I, I'm just sure Everyone must have been thinking, Davy? You know, the one that we give all the grunt work to? Like the little guy? That, what? What did God see in David that the others didn't see? I'm going to tell you what he saw. It's a verse we need to remember. It's in 1 Samuel 16, 7. How about we read it together? Here's what it says. Would you read it with me? The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance. But the Lord looks. Yeah. God doesn't value people the same way our world does. God's commercials look a little different than our commercials. The things that excite him and matter to him aren't the same things that matter to our society. And let's jump back into the text, and we're going to see maybe how their value system here in this context was goofed up in a similar way as our society is too. And so here's how the problem was illustrated. Look at verse 2. So suppose this man comes into your meeting. He's wearing a gold ring. He's wearing fine clothes. And then there's a poor man in filthy old clothes that also comes in. So there's the setup of the appearance. So here's the the receiving the face here's the outward appearance this is what it looked like there's the nice ring the gold you know that there's value to that not just everyone had that in that day and here's the interesting word it says fine clothes and the the original wording for fine is lampros which we get our word lamp So these were not just like, wow, those are really sharp. It was they were bright. They were radiant. People could see this guy coming from a mile away. And he's walking and everyone's like, wow, look how bright and sharp he is. And with that gold ring sticking out there, the second man walks in and here is his, and it mentions 
these filthy old clothes, chances are they are the same clothes that he does work in. And then they are the same clothes that he wears around the house and they're the same clothes that he wears in public because guess what? They're probably his only clothes. And here's how favoritism is evidenced. There's three things. Check this out. It's evidenced in verse 3. If you show, and here's the words, special attention. We're going to talk about it in a moment. If you show special attention, <clears throat> woo! <sighs> hey, which one would you kind of want to hang around? Look at the ring. Look at the shiny ring. Look at the clothes. <clears throat> and we want to hang here. And then here's the guy. He's been wearing those things for a long time. So there's, there's attention. There's time. There's the issue of respect. Because you notice the next thing, not only do you show special attention, but then you say, hey, here's a good seat for you. Here's a great seat. And that's a sign of respect. I, I have a nice spot for you. And back in the day, when seating would be at a premium in, in those situations, here you go, normally slaves would sit on the floor or they would stand against the wall. But those with money and prominence, here you go. And so they would say for him, here you go. Here's a good seat. So there was attention, there was time, there was respect. And then notice the other thing. There was relationship. Because it was not only you sit here, but then here's to the poor man, you stand there. Or sit on the floor by my feet. And guess where the relationship would be? Guess where the conversation would be? It would be for the one who would be next to you. It would be for the one who you gave the respect to and who you give the attention to. And so those are ways that favoritism is seen in everyday life. The preferential seat, the preferential time, the preferential relationship, and I realize that we can have close friends and individuals on the inner circle of our lives. I realize that. But in some situations, that's all we have. And the text mentions that cannot be the case. And so in the church, without any regard for one's character, attitude, integrity, or relationship with God, they made judgments distinctions based on what people wore, what they looked like, and just like the world did and does, they showed favoritism. I don't know if you realize, but Mahatma Gandhi said in his autobiography that during his student days he was interested in the Bible. Deeply touched by reading the Gospels, he seriously considered becoming a convert to Christianity. Did you know this? Christianity seemed to offer the real solution to the caste system that was dividing the people of India. So one Sunday he went to a church to see the minister and asked for instruction on the way of salvation and other Christian doctrines. But when he entered the sanctuary, the ushers refused him a seat and suggested that he go and worship with his own people. He left and never went back. And here's the words in his autobiography. He said, quote, if Christians have caste differences also, I might as well remain a Hindu. Gandhi once quoted um, as saying about believers, I like your Christ, it's just Christians I have a problem with. Isn't that something? Well, biblically, what's the problem with favoritism? talk about this and then we're all going to put our toes out and I get the chance to step on them here as I've stepped on mine all week long what's the problem with favoritism two things amongst many others verse 5 
favoritism is incompatible with how God chooses us. I love verse 5. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? Has not God chosen the poor? Here believers aren't, but God has. And it's incompatible with his choice of people for salvation. And, and the beauty of it, God chooses rich people too. But the reality is God chooses rich and poor, smart and not so smart, famous and the unknown, good looking and not so good looking, skinny people and Baptist. And it all helps us to realize this is a cool thing. God does not base his decisions on what's on the outside. God doesn't choose people like society does. And favoritism is so countercurrent to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if God gives salvation because of who we are, are you ready for this? God gives salvation because of who we are. He gives it not because we're something, but because we're sinners. You with me? Because while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so James came right out and he says, no, 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 no. We don't have the right to say poor people over there, rich people over here, because God doesn't do that. It's incompatible with how God chooses. Number two, it's incompatible with God's great commandment. And I need to keep on trucking here, but there were two great commandments that Jesus gave when the Pharisees were trying to trick him. He says the very first one is love God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And then he said the second one is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. And so this is the second great commandment that he's talking about here, the great commandment. And in fact, he, he quotes it. And he mentions, love your neighbor as yourself. If you really keep the royal law, verse 8, that's found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. And the big problem is if we Sin in one law, he says, you've sinned in them all. It's not like as if I just did this one. He's like, nah, we've just blown the whole gig. There's no way to keep the second commandment, love your neighbor as yourself, and respect one and not respect the other. Value one and devalue the other. Build relationship with one and reject the other. And the crazy thing is when Jesus talked about the, good, the, um, the second law, loving your neighbors yourself, he gave the story of the Good Samaritan. And the, the, the man who was a Good Samaritan was a neighbor of someone who was a competing nationality, who was beat up, who was going to be high maintenance, was going to take a lot of time and money, and he still took the time to care. So here we go. In our staff meeting this week, we were talking about ways that favoritism can be seen in church circles, okay? So here we go. This was our discussion this week. How can churches still show favoritism today? And we just didn't want to go the safe route. We thought, let's, let's really challenge people. Let's get our thinking going here a little bit. And so here's the thoughts that came out of our conversation around the table at our staff meeting. 
And if you don't like these, remember they came from the staff. Here's some, here's some people or groups who sometimes may be on the outside. I, I just, and some of this may grate you just a little bit. I understand. That's good. I want it to. If we just come and everything just feels good, we haven't done our job. I want us to be challenged. I want us to think about this. So, <clears throat> Here's some people who sometimes just might be on the outside. Think about this with us. Some people who sometimes find themselves on the outside. Single, adults, and divorced. Single, adults, and divorced. This one came up. And here's what was said around that. Because some people say, oh, you're in your 40s and you're single, like, what's your problem? You know? Oh, you're divorced? Boy, wonder why that happened. And so much of our society, but even our church circles orbit around couples, and you realize how difficult sometimes it can be to bust in to some of the relational network as a single adult or a divorced adult, even into a small group. Sometimes you can feel like the, you know, the third wheel. And, and these people have value, and in fact, if you look at the Apostle Paul and what he says in the Bible, he's like, bam, they have an advantage for serving Jesus Christ. But I'll be honest, there's sometimes you see a couple walk through the door of church and then you see a lone single adult. And especially if the couple has some really cute kids in tow. Like, woo, here we go over here and the single adult is kind of left out. Here's a second group. Non-white racial groups. Now, I'm, n I'm not running for office, okay? I'm not a quick race card type of guy. But have you noticed that this area of northern Michigan is predominantly white? Have you noticed that? So I'm not imagining this. I remember being um, in lower New Mexico on a train ride. This, this is when I was a senior in high school. So this, man, this got to be 15 years ago. <laughs> and <clears throat> I was on this train ride uh, with some friends. We were going to a competition in Arizona. And we stopped in northern or in southern New Mexico. And we got off at this scheduled stop, and it was going to be like three hours, and of course, all the residents knew. So there's all the marketplaces, everything's set up, and everyone's got all their souvenirs, and everything's laid out. And here's Mr. Ultra White, Brian Conover, with my extra ultra white buddies from a little tiny, extra, extra scrubbed white Christian school in upstate New York, and we walk off the train to a totally ethnic region, and I couldn't even understand a word these people were saying, but I knew they wanted me to buy something. And I remember feeling really uncomfortable. <laughs> like, Toto, we are not in Kansas anymore. This feels really weird. And I remember looking at my buddies and just feeling out of place. And then I wonder, translating that today, because really, look around. Because this is the composition of our region. I know we're mostly white. 
But imagine what it would be for someone non-white to come through the door and to look around at all you scary people and what it could feel like. And I'll tell you what, I can't wait for heaven because we are going to be a gorgeous collage of people who've all put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. And the Bible talks about it. There's no, you know, it's not Jew or Greek, you know, it's not about being male or female. It's not about being a slave or being free, but it's about being one in Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you, some of the best Christian perspective that we could gather would be from some Hispanic brothers and sisters, from some black brothers and sisters. Sometimes they can feel on the outside and just by walking through the door. Here's number three. <clears throat> Women. Women. Okay, so since we're going there today, do realize there are clear teachings in Scripture regarding the roles of women in home and the roles of men in home and the roles of pastor, teacher. And my friend, if they are clear in Scripture, I'm not dialing them back. I'm not here to dabble and adjust God's Word. I'm here to preach God's Word. I'm a messenger, not an adjuster. And so it stays... <clears throat> But with that in mind, there are some extra biblical things that I think culture has developed over time, some extra biblical restrictions and preferences. I remember thinking as a kid, <clears throat> watching the ushers take up the offering, thinking, why can't women take up the offering? But I didn't answer, ask the question, you know. I thought someone's going to think that's a stupid question. I thought, why can't women be ushers? And, and I grew up in a church age, truthfully, when women's thoughts or opinions were reduced just because they were from a woman. I mean, that was the only reason. She's a woman. I'm like, well, glad you figured that one out. <laughs> Way to go, Captain Obvious. You know, it's like, uh... And I like the fact our church has biblical indispensable ways for women to be active from input in the message content our financial handlings training the next generation helping in our pastoral searches and i think it's important to carefully discern biblical roles for men and women <clears throat> and then also what may be carry over from um, prejudice or preference from the past I'm not sure, maybe it's my household of ladies that has softened me to this reality. I was telling folks the other day that the ratio of women to men in my home is six female to three male. Wow. And they said, what if you add the dogs? Does that help? And I said, no, because that adds two females and one male, and the male's neutered. women. Here's number four. The difficult child. This is a tough one. If you've ever worked with kids, you've worked with the kids, you've seen kids run through the foyer. We have a lot of kids around here. It's our church growth strategy that's working beautifully. And we become preference to the well-behaved. You know, the one that walked, not ran, the quiet one, the one that brought their Bible, the one whose verse was perfectly memorized, who's well-dressed, their hair is nicely done. And if you're a worker, I know sometimes the heart sinks when you know, Bucky comes through the door, you know, with ADD and a rat's nest for hair and 
You know, your Monday Zumba workout is nothing compared to chasing him around every Sunday morning. And you're like, why Bucky, God, you know? (laughs) Why couldn't I get spiritual Sally for my children's small group? You know, this is... This is too much. And really, sometimes that difficult child or they don't look as good and they can be on the outside. I want to answer why for all these four groups and others you can put in your mind. Here they are. Verses 12 and 13, these are your last two blanks. Number one, why show mercy? over favoritism. Number one, because we will be held accountable. James says, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. So let your words and let your actions Line up with this because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. The text plainly in verse 9 says that favoritism, like is shown in the text, is sin. Something that God does not do and he does not desire for us to do. It's not a part of his character. And when God talks about the two greatest commandments of loving God, loving your neighbors, yourself, the reality is he means these are commandments. He expects we do it. And by the sounds of verses 12 and 13, like there's some strong accountability to those who do not show mercy, to those who choose favoritism over mercy. And and my thought is who better to show mercy, huh? Huh? than to those who have been shown mercy, the church. So that's number one. We'll be held accountable. Here's number two, and we'll finish with this. Why show mercy? Because mercy makes a difference. Verse 13, mercy makes a difference. And it's the triumphant Phrase at the end of verse 13, mercy triumphs over judgment. I believe it, folks. Ministries that evidence mercy, and I don't know how to say any bolder than this, ministries that evidence mercy will experience multiplication because people are magnetized by mercy. Mercy makes a difference. It's made a difference with our relationship with Jesus. It makes a difference in the life of the single adult or the divorcee who has experienced rejection, in the life of the person who feels ethnically out of place, in the life of the woman who feels looked down upon in the life of Bucky, who isn't even given the time of day in school either. But in church, people love him. And could you imagine what more God could do here if every one of us caught a vision and a passion for mercy? Man. There's a small group that could use your mercy right now. There's a kid in this church that could use your mercy right now. There's people right around you. You don't have to look far. Look in the foyer even when you're standing around. Hang around for a while. People around here need mercy. And if we all grabbed a little vision of what God has done for us and continues to do for us on a daily basis, imagine what mercy could do. Because mercy triumphs over judgment any day. Here's my favorite. 
I'm going to finish with this. I told you this story in the past. I love it. You're going to get it. Dan Taylor wrote of a school experience. Uh, here's what he said. One of the things you were expected to do in grade school was learn to square dance. He said, every time we went to work on our dancing, we did this terrible thing. Boys would all line up at the door of our classroom. Then at one time, each boy would pick a girl to be his partner. The girls sat at their desks. As they were chosen, they left their desks. They joined these snot-nosed kids who had honored them with their favor. And he says, believe me, the boys hated doing this. He said, but think about being a girl. Think about waiting to get picked. Think about seeing who is going to get picked before you. Think about worrying if you were even going to get picked by someone you could stand. Think about worrying if you were going to get picked at all. He said, think if you were Mary. He said, Mary sat near the front of the classroom on the right side. She wasn't pretty. She wasn't real smart. She wasn't witty. She was nice. Nice wasn't enough back then. Mary was not athletic. He said, in fact, she had polio or something when she was younger. One of her arms was drawn up. She had a bad leg. He said, to finish it off, she was kind of fat. And Ms. Owens, our teacher, took me aside one day and said, Dan, next time we have square dancing, I want you to choose Mary. I said, choose Mary? He said, she may as well have told me to fly to Mars. It was an idea so new and inconceivable, I barely could hold it in my head. You mean pick someone other than the best, the most pretty, the most popular when my turn came? I agonized. Choosing Mary would go against all the coolness that I had accumulated. He said, the day came, we were to square dance again, and I, he says, if God really loved me, he would make me last. Then picking Mary would cause no stir. I will have done the right thing, and it would cost me nothing. He said, guess where I was instead. Miss Owens made me first in line, and there I was. He says, my heart pounding. He says, now I knew how some of the girls must have felt. He said, the faces of the girls were turned toward me, some of them smiling, expecting it just might be them because they were the more pretty. He says, I looked down at Mary, and I saw she was half turned to the back of the room. Her face was staring down at her desk. And Miss Owens said, okay, Dan, choose your partner. I remember feeling very far away. And I heard my voice say, I choose Mary. He finishes. Never has reluctant virtue been so rewarded I still see her face undimmed in my memory she lifted her head and on her face reddened with pleasure and surprise and embarrassment all at the same time was the most genuine look of delight and even pride that I have ever seen before or since it was so pure, I had to look away because I did not deserve to see it. Mary came and took my arm as we had been instructed. She walked beside me, bad leg and all, just like a princess. She's my age now. I never saw her after that year. I don't know what her life has been like or what she's doing. He concludes, but I'd like to think she has a fond memory of one day in sixth grade. Because I know I do. And that shows, friends, that mercy triumphs over judgment any day. Catch a vision of that. What could God do with that with everyone? Everyone doing it. But just stand with me. Can we pray? Can we dedicate this place to being people with a heart like Jesus, like the gospel? 
And Father, that is the heart that we want to have. People that love like Jesus. People with an indiscriminate passion to see mercy to whomever. And God, I pray that this momentum that we sense and and experience here, that God, you would only continue to fuel that, that we would see our faith work. Man, this thing would pick up even more steam as our impartiality grows, as our love for those even on the outside grows, as we not only tolerate, but God, we seek out those who may not automatically fit in. And God, as that happens, and as we love like you love, God, continue to help us make more and better for the cause of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the gospel, for your credit and your recognition. And all of East Bay Calvary said,